everybody. Uh, welcome to the Kickstart uh, Presents webinar series, uh, the January edition of this. We have a very, very exciting uh, webinar for you today. Telling your story as a startup and strategies for effective communication and marketing, which are all very, very important, uh, more than ever now in pandemic times, because we need to be able to communicate the value of our startups, of our technologies, and using all sorts of communication tools to effectively transmit the message, getting to the right audiences. So we have a very, very uh, nice panel for you today. Uh, we have two speakers that are gonna be, uh, two talks that we're gonna be experiencing today. The first one comes from our own marketing and communications team at Innovate Carolina. Uh, and uh, from that, we're gonna have Brock Pierce who leads our uh, Innovate Carolina's communications with key audiences. Well, communicating with all faculty, students, and external audiences about all the great stories of innovation that happen at, at UNC, you know, things like messaging, websites, social media, newsletters, all of that is managed um, uh, with uh, Brock's team. And he'll introduce other key members from his team, uh, like Shelly and Sarah as well, when he's going to do his uh, presentation. And then the second speaker, uh, which is going to be about all, also first 15 minutes is going to be in our communications team. And then we're going to have Eva Doss, which is a fantastic speaker as well, who is the president and CEO of the Launch Place here. And it's a venture development organization that has two locations, Danville, Virginia, and here at the RTP in a research triangle park. You know, and they help all the startups create economic impact you know, in the pre-seed and, and seed investment rounds. And they also provide a lot of consulting and mentoring for them. And Eva has fantastic experience in consulting uh, from before. She's worked with Busal and RTI International and the US Agency for International Development in Washington. So again, a lot of experience that she brings to the table for, for us here today. And she'll have a fantastic presentation for you. Then after the two presentations, we're gonna move on to a panel uh, discussion, which we also have uh, Joe Reese, president of Concern of Ion Sciences, who has a very nice story to tell you. Again, he'll also share from the startup perspective, how is a, a, a very uh, a, a new emerging startup that is doing the biotech sector, what are they doing to communicate? And they've developed very interesting approaches to communicating their innovations. And I look forward to discussing that with you and the rest of um, everybody here uh, when we get to the panel session. And he's working with Aaron Delara, who has a company that does marketing and communications. And, a lot of strategies as he's helping and Cerna and others implement in social media strategy and others. So um, look forward also to the um, uh, the communications with Aaron uh, from Richard Marketing, uh, Aaron Richard Marketing, uh, who he's the owner and founder of that. So with that, I'm gonna let Brock start with the first session and really talk about our marketing communications. So Brock, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks Maria, it's a pleasure to be with you all today, uh, as Maria mentioned, uh, our team works on um, marketing communications with Innovate Carolina um, across the university and in the community with uh, a number of innovators, entrepreneurs, and inventors. And so uh, it's, it's great to be able to um, share some of that with you all today and um, all learn together. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, to um, pull up just a few slides as visual aids um, for today's discussion. Uh, so let me get those pulled up. Okay, you should be able to see these slides. Wonderful. Um, and as uh, Maria mentioned, uh, joining me today um, are um, two critical members of our Innovate Carolina team, uh, Sarah Daniels and Shelly Edge. So you'll be hearing a lot from them. Sarah um, is um, an entrepreneur in her own right. She's started um, a, a photography studio um, here in the area. She's a master photographer, uh, a lot of experience in um, video work, uh, visual communications and works with our team um, on our social media websites and our general communications work. So uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of areas there. And then Shelly um, is a writer and content um, creator on our team um, who has um, agency backgrounds um, from a number of agencies and account uh, management and supervision. And then also um, uh, with Innovate Carolina is 
a writer, content creator, the lead on our uh, weekly newsletter. Um, if you are subscribed to that, um, Shelly's the, the mastermind behind our newsletter and then also works on our um, PR and media relations work. So it's the member of our team. And uh, you know, just as we get started, um, I wanted to just, you know, as we're thinking about marketing and, and branding, uh, just a quick, um, a quick exercise here is, um, have you all seen this piece of art before? Um, has anyone seen this? Um, it's called American Alphabet by Heidi Cody. So do you, um, can you all, I mean, a lot of these you may be able to get quickly. Um, can you just name some of these? Which ones jump out as uh, brands that you recognize just by a single letter? So the A's, I think, all for the detergent, these like, honestly, bubble dishes. He's obviously Campbell's. Um, you know, M is like M&M's, uh, S is for Starburst, R is Reese's, P is for Pez. You know, it's very, you familiarize with these, you know, very easily. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're all recognizable. Are there any of them stump you? Any of that, like, you look at? I, know I there's think, all... yeah, I think maybe D gets me a little bit and maybe Z. Which one was that? D. Oh, D. Yeah, yeah D is Dawn, Dawn Soap. There you go, yep. Yeah, yeah. So this is a fun a fun exercise, a fun things to, you know, share with uh, your colleagues or friends or family, but um, these, these are all, you know, iconic um, brand marks. And so the, the purpose of showing this is um, really to just get to the idea of when we think about a brand, a lot of times we in marketing we often jump to you know a logo or a brand mark because those are um, those are often what come to mind immediately for us. But really, when we're talking about um, a brand, the way we try to think about that more broadly is the overall thoughts or feelings, what you think or feel about an organization or a person, um, no matter what brings that to mind. So it could be. Um, a logo. Um, a lot of times we see a logo and that's going to make us think um, obviously of that brand and um, but it might be anything else out in the world, social media, um, you know, website, there are lots of different touch points for a brand. So really, obviously brand is much bigger than a logo. Um, so we're going to be thinking about today some of the different touch points um, that bring a brand or a company to mind. Um, no matter what those particular touch points are. We will obviously want to have an integrated uh, message and look and feel across all those things. So um, just starting high level, when we think about branding, and I know uh, with um, a lot of young organizations, and, and truthfully, uh, Innovate Carolina is, is a young organization in and of itself. We are really like a, um, almost like a startup organization within the university. Uh, we've only been around a few years. And so we've gone through a lot of this work ourselves, um, thinking about these types of things. And so this is a, a framework that we have used as we've considered um, our brand and marketing work. And I'm not going to go through every bit of this, but just to say, to step back and as we're thinking about marketing organ our organizations, it's um, really easy to jump into, well, we got to build a website, we got to get a logo, you know, we have to get a social media account up. Yes, we do have to do all of those things. But there's a really a lot of groundwork that is really important to be done, um, either hopefully before we start too much of that work, or at least in, in parallel. And, uh, you know, at that top level is our, you know, our, our core, our brand core. And those are things like our, our brand values, our mission and vision statements. You all know what those things are. Um, but um, they, it's worth taking the time to consider those and, um, and really put that foundation in place. The other, um, you know, that middle band is brand messaging. And these are all elements of when we're talking about our brand, when we're expressing our brand, what's what's the core message that we're trying to get out? And there are different ways of getting at that message. So for instance, something like a brand essence, um, that's a really short little statement. It's, it's not even necessarily a tagline, um, but for something like um, Disney, the brand essence would be magical, right? Um, or for um, Nike, it would be um, athletic or authentic athletic performance. That might translate into a tagline for Nike to just do it, 
right? Or the brand essence for, let's say, a, a company like BMW is driving pleasure. And then that would translate into a tagline for the ultimate driving machine. You get it. And you've seen and heard all these things. So, um, and you all know what value propositions are. They're going to, you know, those value statements for each company, the promises that we're delivering and all those things really tr translate to our brand personality. So we like to, and these are things that we've defined for our organization. If you were a, you know, just think about if your company was a person, right? And you met them at a party, how would you describe them? Are they witty? Are they intelligent? Um, are they matter of fact, helpful, approachable? And last in that messaging, but message pillars. And so when we're thinking about getting our messages out, just defining pillars as an organization, you know, what, how do we organize the content that we're trying to create for the world? You know, an example of this would be, you know, I used to work in marketing at McDonald's and one of their brand pillars was place for kids. And you can think about all of the types of messages that a company like that would put out around that one single pillar, right? Um, last on this chart, uh, brand identity. And so this is our voice and our visual identity. So on the voice, how we write and speak. And so for any, um, any organization, new or old, um, it is really essential to think about that voice. And there are a lot of things that go, you know, to just developing how the rhythm to how you speak you sound relative to other companies developing your unique voice. And what I would say is two of the, two of the big things that, um, you know, we really try to focus on is um, a really trying to write conversationally um, writing like we talk, and that can mean breaking the rules that you were taught in school. So it's okay to begin sentences with, and um, it's, you know, it's okay to have to use fragment sentences sometimes um, because we talk that way and, and that in the business world, um, that's more uh, the norm and the expectation um, than, you know, purely using, you know, all the rules that we were taught in school. So a great example of this, you know, go look at Apple's website, go look at Adobe's website. They're masters at this. And so um, this is, and it really makes the company more approachable and And I would say in terms of style, the other thing was we just try to avoid jargon, business jargon. And that's really easy to say, and it can be hard to do. Um, but it's the difference between saying we're going to leverage our synergies or we're going to work together. You know, those are, um, you say, well, who says that kind of stuff? Well, we all do, you know, and it's, we all fall into that trap, but it's just something that we try to be cognizant with. Visual identity, we'll focus a little more, Sarah was going to talk a little more about logo in a second, but there are all these elements in the visual side that are really key as um, you're thinking about your marketing strategy, um, you know, Companies eventually develop brand guides and identity guides around this. We've done that ourselves. Um, but this overall structure just kind of gives you the, the overall framework of how we think about things. Um, again, last thing here on the upfront part is just um, thinking about the brand touch points. Again, much more than a logo. All of these things um, influence brand perception. And we want to think about them, um, while we have to think about them individually, they're all connected. And so we want to pro try to provide a uh, somewhat of a consistent experience across these um, and let them do their own function, their own thing, what they need to um, take care of for you. Um, but they all drive back to brand's perception. So we'll talk about a few of these today. Um, Sarah and Shelly are going to go through and talk about a couple of these different elements. And, and what I'll do is I'm going to turn it over to Shelly now. And she's going to talk about, um, you know, marketing calendars and planning. So as you're thinking about all those different touch points, it can be just so overwhelming. And so one thing we do at Innovate Carolina is we think about, okay, when we're uh, communicating our messaging, we have to really map that out on a calendar. And so Shelly's going to kind of talk through how and why we do that and, and what that and some tools for approaching that. Yeah, thanks, Brock. So um, yeah, as Brock mentioned, you know, once you have that brand framework in place, you'll want to think through your content and, um, you know, how you can most effectively reach your target audience. And this graphic just shows a good snapshot of, you know, a variety of content out there that you can pick. There's probably more um, that we could list on this. Uh, one key point I would say, I know for at least us, is when you are thinking about your content, one strategy we have is to think about how you can repurpose your content, right? You want to get the most bang for your buck. So, for example, if you 
write a feature story, which is something that we do um, quite often. You know, we write our story, but then we think how we can repurpose it. So it doesn't just go on our website, but it'll go out in our newsletter, um, potentially social media as well. Um, and then, you know, we may um, even use it, turn it into a Q&A as well. So there's all, you know, sorts of um, formats and channels that you can use. But I think the key takeaway here would be, um, you know, just kind of thinking in how you want to repurpose the content that you have. And then you can go ahead to the next slide, Brock. And then, you know, just thinking about your marketing calendars and a way to plot your content out because, you know, if you can have a plan in place that will outline your um, content either week by week or month by month, it'll just ensure that you have that steady stream of content and promotion that's going out on a consistent basis, either on your product or for your company. So it's a really great planning tool. And we've just listed some of uh, the items that you may want to add to your marketing calendar. You know, it could be a product update, a launch. Um, it could be a pitch event that you have, um, you know, web content. That's a big one. You know, just thinking through month by month, um, what are the big things that uh, need to happen with your website? Making sure that you plot that out just to give yourself enough time to um, get all those things done. Um, and then, you know, just kind of going down there to the bottom, some tools uh, to build your calendar. And this really um, will depend on how your team works. You know, it could be as simple as a Google Calendar, um, or you may want to use a spreadsheet. I know our team, we use a tool, you know, some of these tools are free, which um, is can come in very handy, especially when you're starting out. We use what's called um, Smartsheet. I believe there is a cost to that, but um, it does provide live updates. So our team can share the updates and, and see what we're updating. So if we're on calls or meeting virtually like that, we can see those updates as they happen live. So there's some project management tools listed here as well, um, as well as some content calendar calendar apps. So um, again, I think the biggest takeaway from the planning is that it will just ensure that your company, your team is really being consistent about getting your content out there. Um, and we all know that different events happen in the world every day. There's different things happening all the time, which may skew you a little bit. But if you do have this blueprint and this plan in place, um, you know, it should keep you on track. Um, and it'll also allow you to kind of measure things as well. So, you know, if you plot things out for the next six months or a year, and you're sitting around and, you know, maybe you have a board or an advisory board or someone, you know, what have you been doing with your marketing efforts? You also have a way to measure what you've done. And then if you need to adjust your strategy, you can do that as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about logo, uh, logos are important. Um, go ahead and, uh, advance to the next slide. Um, one of the reasons why they're so important, um, you can see the line, your brand and a blank. Um, your logo is what identifies your company. Um, my biggest recommendation is to actually hire a designer to create a logo, preferably something that will last that's perennial and that's where a designer really comes in handy um someone who has some experience with it i think the logo you can get a website on squarespace or wix but having a really good logo um is, is probably so sorry it's probably um the best place you can put your money One second. um sorry about that so I would say that was one of the first things that I did when I started my business is I hired a designer to do my logo. Um, I mean, I guess theoretically you can do it yourself, but if you have a nice logo, a strong logo, you won't need to revisit it. And one of the things that can keep your company looking professional is consistency. So, you know, even if you change your logo five years down the road, you'll still have things that have an older logo on it. And that's just kind of, um, you just want to be consistent as much as possible. You don't want to have to throw things away because uh, has a different logo or an older logo. Um, and you want one that will last you more than three years. So really that's where a designer comes in handy. They will communicate with you, um, give you ideas and, and choices and um, really help you develop a strong brand. Um, as far as your website goes, um, again, this is your digital front door. This is where people are going to find you. My suggestion is plan a lot. So our team has um, launched 
gosh, I think like three websites so far in the last year are working on it. Um, and so as we've gone through this process, not to mention the websites I've lost for my business and my husband's business, he actually owned his own business as well. Um, but you want to, before you even sit down, get into Squarespace, get into Wix, um, you want to think about who your user is and how they're going to navigate the site. So that's where a content map or a wireframe will come in. It's not as hard as it sounds. Um, it's just where you want your customer to go. So on the home page, do you want them to read about the company, see who the founders are, learn more about your tool or your diagnostics? Um, and where would they go from there? And then always, um, I'm gonna kind of skip through this for time's sake, but um, you will really want to make sure that you, I'm gonna highlight the bullet that says leave time to load content and test. Um, this is not something you wanna do the night before a trade show. Um, you wanna get this done and then turn it over to your friends and family and ask them something. Say, okay, if you needed to send me a message, can you do it? And then watch them interact with your website. It's You can see if there's any glitches or if they have any issues finding the contact form, for instance, or you can ask them to find a recent news story um, and just make sure that all those things are easy to find so the user doesn't get frustrated. We all know that feeling of a badly created website where you can't find what you need. Um, and you can go ahead. Uh, for social media, um, this one I think is really important as well. Um, if you have a good brand and a good uh, logo, a nice website, this would be the next step. Um, I would not, people jump into this quickly without a game plan. And um, I think that it's best to wait until you have your other pieces in place. The reason why is that you can leverage your social media to gain a broader reach into your audiences. And if you haven't done the background work, um, you won't be getting the type of responses that you want or people just aren't going to see you. Um, I would not start with a, um, with a presence in every channel. I would pick maybe two or even just one to start with. And then I would share very consistently on it. I mean, if you share once a week, every week, but you're consistent about it, it's better than sharing every day for a week and then not again for a month later. So before you jump into it, make sure that you have a plan to be consistent. Um, and if you have the money, this is a good place to put it into an intern, someone who can kind of take this off your plate for you. Or even like a high schooler who needs an afternoon job could probably help you out with this as well. Um, there's different perspective, oh, sorry, Brock. I was gonna say, think about the different channel perspectives as well. You guys will get this PowerPoint so you can go through it yourselves. Um, so here, uh, thank you, Sarah and Shelly. Um, I'm not, we won't go into deep into communication tools now. We'll save that for the end on communi um, with Q&A time. We can mention, um, recommend some specific communication tools for social media, website, um, even resources around design for logo. So, um, and that will be available in the PDF that goes out, um, but also um, we're happy to talk through that um, in our Q&A time. So I'll, um, stop share and turn it back over uh, to the team. Uh, and uh, Eva, you should have access to to put on your presentation now. Thank you. Can you all see the presentation? Yes. Yes, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, as I was introduced, I'm the president and CEO of the Launch Place. And before I get into the actual discussion about how to communicate with investors, I thought I'd share a few slides about the Launch Place and, and uh, who the angel investment community is, what are the different um, types of angel investors and what is the difference between choosing an approach when you are trying to reach angel investors versus um, venture capital organizations. So the launch place, as it was mentioned, is a venture development organization. We um, manage two separate investment funds, a pre-seed investment fund and a seed fund. In the pre-seed investment fund, we are looking to invest in companies that are very, very early stage and they are not necessarily ready to receive funding from a seed stage angel network or fund. They still need to either further develop their MVP 
or they still need to achieve some uh, market validation. And through the pre-seed, we like to help these companies by investing anywhere from twenty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars, most likely in tranches, milestone-driven tranches, um, where we negotiate with the company founders and management specific milestones, and we release the funds associated with the achievement of those milestones. Once the companies spend the pre-seed investment funds and they are ready to take on a seed round, we can carry on investing in the company from our seed fund. The every check size that we write from the seed is about $250,000 and we can go up to actually 750 um, investing in companies that are scaling up and meeting their milestones. We are also known for a lot of our syndication efforts. So whilst we can lead around and we can be a lead investor, 90% of our deals are in partnership in syndication with other funds and networks throughout the Southeast. And that helps us um, also in two ways. A, we can help the company founder close the round and stop raising funds and focus on developing the company faster but also it allows the launch place to potentially seal deals or startups from outside the North Carolina and Virginia community. We are located, we have two offices, one in Danville, Virginia, and one in the Research Triangle Park. And our purpose is not just to receive a return on our investments, but we are also focused on creating economic impact in the Den River region. Our fund, we are a managed fund, but we follow the typical recruitment process and communication process um, with all of our startup companies that are interested in potentially receiving funding from us. Most likely the first contact um, that we have with a startup is either through a warm introduction of one of our co-investor partners or an angel investor can just introduce a company to us. But we also meet a lot of companies through um, networking, opportunities, different um, business plan competitions that either we organize or our partners organize. And also through webinars like just like this. I um, Many times I'm invited to speak and then afterwards, a lot of startups and founders can find me either on LinkedIn or can directly reach out to me via email. Once we make that initial contact, uh, we really like to review the company speech deck first. And if we are aligned in terms of industry focus, size of the round, potential scale up opportunities. Then we invite the company founder and management for a screening interview. Post interview, we ask the company to make a formal application through our website. And after that application is formalized, we conduct a very light due diligence which is mainly focused on competition market size and some financial projections. We want to determine whether the company is really the right fit and the right alignment for us. And if it is, we invite the company to pitch to our seed fund advisory board. The seed fund advisory board consists of other investors, both venture capital fund managers and also other angels or angel network and angel fund seed fund managers from Virginia and North Carolina. Once the presentation is made to the seed fund advisory board, post presentation, the seed fund advisory board um, in communication with staff decides whether the company is too early and maybe we just need to wait a little longer, six to eight months and put the company on a watch list. Um, we might find out from a seed fund advisory board that they don't believe it's a good alignment for us to invest in a company and then we kindly decline participation in the round, or the best outcome is when the seed fund decides that this is a great opportunity and we wanna pursue future further due diligence. Once the green light is received by the, seed, by the staff, um, we, do, um, we conduct a very deep dive due diligence process, which can last up to two months, maybe three. It depends on how well the company is prepared uh, to receive investment investment funds from angel investors. And at the end of that very thorough due diligence, we submit a 40 to 50 page report to our board of directors with a recommendation whether to invest or not. Um, if the recommendation to invest is accepted, that's when we enter into negotiating the term sheet and after the term sheet, of course, the closing documents. 
it sounds like a convoluted process. It looks more convoluted than it is in reality, but I wanted to share this chart with you just to understand that throughout each and every step, we are in direct communication with our potential startup companies. And the faster and the easier we can get the information that we need, the faster and easier the process is for everybody. Our main focus in terms of industries is definitely information technology, software, we have also invested in Internet of Things companies, SaaS companies. Um, we have one um, consumer goods products company, but we are really, really focused on innovative technology-based companies that ultimately will end in an exit and we can have our return on investment and also potential economic impact creation in our region. So all this is to say that we are a little bit different than the other investors, but an angel profile can really vary from um, network to fund, from fund to individual investors. But who are these angels that we are talking about? Angels are mainly uh, wealthy individuals and they meet the accreditation criteria and they become accredited investors. In order to become an accredited investor, an individual needs to have a net worth of a million dollars or more and an annual income of 200,000 if it's a single individual. Uh, most of these angels are experienced and successful entrepreneurs. They have built their own companies and they successfully exited. And from the money they received for the sale of their companies, they can actually make additional investments to new startups in the region. Angels can range from passive investors all the way to lead and very active investors. More often than not, individual investors have a tendency to be more passive versus investment funds or networks, especially if they are lead investors are much more active and they take board representation, board voting or observation roles inside the company. Each investor might decide to invest different amounts. Each fund might be different. Each network might be different but the range for an angel investor in terms of the size of check, uh, in terms of the check size is anywhere from 25 to $500,000. Based on the Angel Capital Association's estimate, which we are members and most accreditor investor partners that we work with are members of the ACA, there are about 335,000 active angels, um, active meaning that we know about them, they are, investing in a regular basis, but in reality, there could be potential, potentially up to 5 million individual investors who are just writing checks without joining a network or a fund. Um, approximately in the United States, um, there are 400 angel groups and they are divided into networks and funds. And out of the 400 um, individual groups, there is a lot of syndication in between these 400 angel groups that are members of the ACA, there is a lot of syndication happening. Whether you are a fund, a network, or an individual, I guess one of the main, main threads is all of us like to invest close to home. And it's mainly because once we make an investment, we like to be in touch with the company, especially if you are a lead investor, and we like to be in a driving distance so we can attend board meetings. Of course, that was the case before COVID. Now we all learned how to attend board meetings remotely and we are pretty much zoomed out. But in, in general, um, investors like to invest very close to home. Um, as I mentioned, most of the angels are individual angels writing individual checks but some of them are um, more interested in joining either an angel network or an angel fund. A fund is just like the launch place, professionally managed. We have full-time full employees who are managing the fund and doing the due diligence. And since angel networks can have up to 200 members of individual angels, and it's a volunteer entity, and all the due diligence work is by being done but on a volunteer basis. What's really interesting about the investment community, and I know it's a lot of information, but we need to kind of understand who is our target market when we are communicating to 90% of the outside equity capital funding for seed stage entrepreneurs comes from angels and not venture capitalists. So it's really important to make sure that we all understand what motivates um, 
these angels. Venture capitalists are in the business to really make money and have return on investment. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a little bit different motivation than for angels. Angel funds and networks, most of the members of the angel funds and networks um, are doing the investment in order to stay involved. Um, there is a sense of engagement after they successfully exited one or two or maybe even multiple companies. They still want to be part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the investment landscape. There is also a little bit of camaraderie that comes from being a startup founder and CEO. And a lot of angel investors that we work with just simply like to help. They want to be mentors and coaches and want to help new startups to achieve their objectives. There is also an intrinsic value um, from being an angel investor that is to help the region and the state and the local community uh, by investing in startups. And angels also are much more willing to invest in higher risk companies. Venture capital comes on the top of the angel investing, but the riskiest bets really are being made by angel investors. Having said all this, the return on investment is still the key metric. And everybody who is writing checks and invests in startup companies ultimately is motivated by, by making money on their investments in spite of the very high risk. So the goal in communication to investors is really to provide information that moves people to action. The first contact in communicating with angels is not necessarily, it's not necessarily, not definitely to uh, have the first check signed on the spot, but making an impression on an angel investor and he or she, based on that first contact, then will ask you as a founder to follow up and reach out um, and provide a pitch deck and learn more about the company. So the initial contact is extremely important. Hello? Hello? Uh, yep. Uh. I'm sorry, my, okay, here we go, sorry. So how do we gain access to um, angel networks? As I said, most angels form networks formally or informally, but um, also individual angels see deal flows coming from venture capital organizations, universities, and other um, groups that might be formally organized and might not be formally organized. What is key in accessing and made, making that first contact is really finding an internal champion a member of an angel group or an angel fund who can make that first introduction is extremely important. The first introductions can be also made, and this is many, many times overlooked by professional service providers, many lawyers, accountants, marketing contractors, um, individuals, that, individuals and professional service providers that are helping startups to uh, create their future are also many times, oftentimes, members of these networks and groups. And just ask them to make an introduction and get you invited into their next meeting. Each and every network um, has a policy that a member of the network is allowed to bring in a guest. And that's a very great uh, way to network with angel investors. But also, as a startup, you can gain insight about how the pitches happen. Targeting VCs and angel funds is also very important, uh, mainly networking, industry-focused events, conferences, websites. Um, angel investors are more available now than ever before, especially during the COVID. Many, many, many of us are participating on online webinars, seminars, business plan competitions. We are judges and we are all welcoming um, of new ideas and post presentations, we are more than happy to share our personal contact information. Don't forget, angels are looking for deal flow. Angels are looking for new ideas to invest in, whilst you are looking for angels to invest in your ideas. So we are most likely aligned. Um, there are also other ecosystem resources that you can reach out to through the uh, Small Business and Technology Development Center in North Carolina. But you can also research individually in your free time additional databases when you can find lists of different investors just like GUST or Angel Investment Network um, or even on the Angel Capital Association website. You can have 
you can find some very comprehensive list of um, angel funds and networks that you potentially can reach out to. What is really important um, before the first contact or before you reach out is to really understand their investment thesis. Um, not every fund and network is focused on the same industry or product category. It's very important to learn ahead of time what's the size and stage of their portfolio investments, what type of companies they are investing in, and what's the life cycle of the fund. Are they at the beginning of investing from the fund or are they at the end of the life cycle? Because that will determine whether they are even making new investments into new companies or are they more focused on helping their existing portfolio to scale? What we are looking for is confidence, honesty, vision and leadership. Um, we want to make sure that the founders and the CEO of the company that we are investing in has the same integrity and transparency as we like to have. So it's extremely important that during, from the very beginning of your initial communication throughout the life cycle of the investment that you are honest, transparent, and you share the good, the bad, and the ugly with your investors from the very, very beginning. The right way of interact, I would like to share if we have time, but perhaps I'm looking at my watch, we might not have time for naming some of the best ways or samples our best use case scenarios from my experience. I would more be more than happy to discuss some of the best experiences, how we communicated with invest with uh, startups and also some of the not so good experiences. I'm more than happy to give some examples during the Q&A uh, session. Again, just to close with um, some of the takeaways, the most common mistakes to make is not researching the interest of the angel group properly and therefore wasting your time and also the angel group time by approaching them and contacting them. Also, many, many times it happened to me, I was flying out to um, San Francisco a couple of years ago and right next to me on an airplane was a startup founder and within five minutes, um, she was able to pitch me um, her pitch deck. So being prepared is extremely key, but also not being prepared can um, ultimately end your relationship and future communication uh, with the angel group you are targeting. Also key is not accepting money from non-accredited investors. This can really hurt the company's future fundraising strategy and I can delve into it potentially offline. Um, and also paying angel group brokers. It's a waste of your money because ultimately we are all looking to invest in a group, in the management team, in the founder group. So using a service uh, brokers in order to find your investors is not the right way to go. And just the last, very last takeaway, we like honesty above all and transparency. So it's much better to under promise and over deliver versus the over promise and under deliver scenario. And thank you so much for inviting me and I'm more than happy to cover additional topics during the Q and A. Thank you so much, Eva. And, and again, now I also kind of want to invite uh, as well to the panel, uh, the Q and A panel. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we we have Joel Reese, who is a fantastic entrepreneur and academic. You, uh, uh, I mean, Joe uh, has over 30 years of experience you know, in, in research and innovation. You know, he is an adjunct professor of, of biology at UNC, and not only that, you know, he is uh, currently the president of Encerna Biosciences as well as Epigenos Biosciences, and has worked with a number of biotech startups. Uh, like Vesta Therapeutics, Transprogen, Biopharmaceuticals, as well, as well as many others. And on top of that, he also has uh, his own uh, consulting practice to help uh, entrepreneurs uh, and is very successful with them, has helped over 50 startup ventures funding. So he knows a thing of two, how to, to put a good compelling message out there in terms of both raising funding and communicating ones. And we really wanted to also invite Encerna to give the startup perspective because you're hearing from uh, the angel group and our communications team what we think are the good communication channels, what the angels want to hear. But uh, putting your uh, startup hat, uh, Joe, uh, please tell us a little bit of you know what sort of channels are you using to communicate and engage with with investors. You know, obviously a lot of the points that Eva 
how I'm sure are useful, what has worked for you, what, what hasn't. And, uh, and briefly also, before I forget, inviting uh, Aaron to, to the table who has, like I said, his own uh, company uh, to really support all the small businesses to, to create this viable marketing plans for them in terms of social media and, and a number of other things. So welcome, Joe and, and Aaron, please, please go ahead, Joe. Thank you very much, Maria. This has been a fantastic talk so far. And what's great is that I'm going to, if possible, I'm going to show the first page of my website because basically everything that uh, Brock, that you raised, without knowing it, I followed the pathway that all of your team followed. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and the people I'm trying to reach are the kind of people that Ava talked about. So it's almost like it pulls everything together. They all come together. And so if it's possible to share my first screen, it started with my logo. And um, I'll share my the first page on my website. And um, can you see my first page of my website? Yep. And before I go there, Brock said something very key about jargon. And so what I decided to do is hire people to do my website and social media who are not scientists. And you might think, well, why would you do that? It's because I'm trying to communicate to people who are not scientists. And as scientists, we tend to we confuse people. So I need to get my message out using the language that people would understand. And so for a website, my website is actually more in the fashion design industry. And so I wanted to have a website that was different than others. But first go to the, to the, the logo. Uh, we are a company that makes enzymes to edit RNA as a gene therapeutic. And so Don Rose is that one who actually created the name for our company. He took the beginning of enzyme and hooked it up to RNA and said, you should call yourself Enzerna. And so what I did is I did exactly what Innovation Carolina said. I hired a local designer to, I said, I wanted something futuristic that's clean, that sort of shows what we do. So the little logo is actually a, a, like a mechanism of accident of how our therapeutic works. And it divides enzyme and RNA in two different colors. And so that is very easy to understand. And so the other key thing to remember for this is I, scientists are old and by old, I mean over 30. I'm not gonna say old I am, but to get something that's contemporary, you need to talk to people who are younger. So I gave pitches or talks to students. And the first thing they said, which was such a great idea and I never thought of it. They said, all the fonts in your pitch decks and your website should match the color of your logo. I just have black and white pit, uh, pitch deck. And so, Everything I have, have the, has the color scheme of my logo. So it's sort of subliminal. You don't know it, but it gives it a bit of sharpness. You can look at my first page. The learn more is the color of my RNA. The background is blue for Enzerna. So all my headings are going to be like that, shifting orange and blue. So it gives it a sharpness that, that you don't notice for most biotechs. And, and that's, I think that's where you can start getting a brand where Brock was talking about. That was, what I, that was my goal for 2020. My goal for 2021 is now to bring social media to help piggyback into my internet website, which is exactly what Brock was talking about. Don't do your internet first, then do social media. And so that's my that's what I'm doing in 2021 is develop a social media presence. And like I said before, social media tends to be younger people. So you need to hire someone from that generation if you want to be relevant and speak the language that you're trying to reach. And so that's why I hired Aaron, who has a track record in, in leading small businesses, but he's also younger. I'm not gonna say how young you are, Aaron. You're over 30, I think, so you're okay. You're not, you're kind of old, but not too old. <laughs> I'm not on the coast right there. <laughs> yes. And so, and so that way I can speak the language and not speak like a jargon with a scientist. And so I have a brand that I wanna give. I give a lot of pitches. Um, since I'm an academic, I have more of a patient focus in my pitches even though we're trying to make money as a company and people are starting to realize, oh, you really care about truly trying to treat patients. So a lot of people are creating a therapeutic to make money or for the sake of the science. I really do feel and two people in my company are focused just on patient advocacy. And so I have a passion for patients and that comes across my pitches. And so that's what I want to develop my social media is that we're a company that cares about patients, even though we are 
dedicated to making science. And that's where social media is going to come in because I need to start building in the community, engaging with the right hashtags, which I have no idea what that means. That's why I hired Aaron to help me. So we can develop that brand and the message of who we are so that angel investors, when they see us, because they're gonna look at social media and internet, they say, oh, they're passionate, they have vision, they have confidence, everything that Eva said, uh, that, that they would be attracted to us. So that's, that's basically the story. That's fantastic, and uh, thank you so much. And, and and I would like to talk a little bit more about the social media aspect in, in a minute, but uh, something that you just mentioned also, I wanted to kind of also ask uh, Eva's perspective as well, is uh, you mentioned a lot of great uh, events and ways of keeping up with, with angels um, and, and reaching investors. Uh, and I would like to hear both the, the startup side as well as the investor side to this answer is like how you make a good impression, you, you were prepared, like you said, Eva, you, you do a good pitch, but like you mentioned, most investors will not uh, do write a check right off the bat. Um, so how do you, you know, how many times do you wanna hear from, from companies? What are you looking in those marketing communications to you to kind of keep the interest going? What is going to kind of convince somebody to finally uh, pull the plug, you know? Uh, you know, how do you structure that engagement over time? <laughs> right, great question. Thank you so much. It really depends on the stage of the company. If we are looking at very early stage that we are the first institutional money in, they have never raised before, but they are trying to raise from, from a fund. Um, and they are introduced to us by other syndication partners and they have already done their pitch deck and they are ready to go. That's a much easier uh, pathway forward because they, but by this time they have figured out that they need to communicate on a monthly basis. But for those who are just starting out, I would meet someone at a um, networking event and I hear the two minute elevator pitch within two minutes, we will know whether we are aligned in terms of industry target. And I get a feel for the passion and the enthusiasm for the, for the founder. After that pitch, we would schedule, after that initial introduction, we would schedule an interview where we would really dive into what the company is about. And if it's way too early, then we ask the company to really keep communicating with us. And every two months, not more than two months, every two months, we are expecting to get an update from them, an investor update or a newsletter where they are highlighting the bad, the good, and the ugly, but there is a communication coming, going back and forth. And more often than not, the ones that are involved with us and trying to establish that relationship, they're not just going to share with us the positives, but they're also going to reach out and say, hey, I'm having a real issue developing a pricing strategy based on your portfolio companies. Have you come across with it? Can you please help us figure it out? And more often than not, if you are interested in the company, we will engage with them even prior to approaching us. But we want to hear from them at least every two months, if not every month. And Joe, from your experience, you know, has that been the case? Do you keep up updates every every other month with a with you know potential VCs or angels, yeah. Others. Um, not, not. I do not. And that is, it's hard as a startup to to do all that plus run the company. And so, uh, what I would like to do is passively through social media. Now I'm not ever you know contacting them. But hopefully, if they're interested, they go to the website, which I have links to all these sites. Yeah. And and so I don't know how to do that, and I don't know what's the appropriate contact for each of these platforms. And I think that's why it's important for someone to hire someone like Aaron, who knows what's the appropriate contact for each one, so that I can put the kind of information that educate campus does look at my website. They want to find out what's going on. They can see what's going on in the company. But I don't know whether angels do that. Do they look at these sites? Um, just, just to give a perspective on a monthly basis, we get about 40, 50 applications like, or interest from different companies. Uh, we're not going to follow up and look at the social media site for 40, 50 companies. So mm -hmm. the ones that actually send us an email, a one pager and say, this is what happened in the company. This is how many new clients I have recruited. And it's just a one pager. It's not fancy. It's not designed, but it really gets to the KPIs and projections. 
those we definitely going to focus on, but we do not go out of our way to visit each and every applicant's um, website and social media. Okay. We, just don't, we just don't have time to do that. But Maria, one reason I do want to do this is not so much for raising funds. Okay. And, and I was going to say that because there's different audiences. Uh, right. I'm, I'm sure that you're trying to target as well, like Rock uh, and and Sarah and Shelly were saying, you have all these social media channels and obviously there's engagement with investors uh, and there's different ways to engage with investors like Ella was mentioning. But Joe, maybe can you talk a little bit of what, what, had, what has driven you to kind of try to focus on social media strategy uh, this year? Yeah? Because I, I've been doing a lot of uh, pitches to disease foundations. Mm -hmm. And these are generally run by wealthy individuals who their children may are, are affected by disease. And right. they are desperate to have people work on these disease to get cures for their, their children or their friends' children, or they build a community. It's a community that talks through social media. And, and, and it's hard to, I wanna be able to sh tell this community, we are trying to develop something for you. Not necessarily that we have the money, but we want to build, you know, uh, uh, people to know that what we're doing. So we talk with each other. They talk to their friends, and that's how thing, things might happen. So it's a passive way, not direct. It's almost yeah. like networking at that level. Yeah. And, and, and I imagine then again that that you know having that um, targeting that audience then later uh, you know helps you collect data that will in a way also kind of showcase to investors later on that you have a, a target market and validating that that target market is there uh, through through social media because if you can engage with people uh, uh, there that have interest in the potential products that you're going to be developing that's very powerful as well as evidence uh, later on uh, is that correct yeah yes and, and and with that in mind and again that's something that i kind of wanted to highlight in, in this talk is this, when we're thinking about small startups particularly university startups you tend to focus a lot on the technology and, and the problem. And, and yes, I want to communicate with angels and other VCs, but you know, we forget the communication uh, channels uh, like the ones presented today are also a super invaluable tool to engage with, with your potential users and kind of again build credibility when you reach out to, to uh, your potential investors as well. So, uh, Brock, uh, uh, Sarah, Shelly, Aaron, I don't know if anybody wants to comment a, a little bit as to, again, with, with these strategies in mind, you know, how do small startups, particularly those from universities, can, can you know, get those messages across through, through social media? What, if somebody's considering, you know, setting up social media channels like this, what, what should they keep in mind? I think it's definitely knowing what channels to go to, right? There's so many different social media sites and it seems that there might be new ones coming up every you know, day, but it's knowing which are the biggest ones and what type of content to put on them. You wanna, in a sense, create a, create a sense of community with the people that you're trying to target, especially with something that's intimate like this patient advocacy. Uh, especially for me, coming at it from the perspective of a marketer, when I'm sitting down, you know, with a client, especially in a biotech, you know, industry, it's important for me to kind of, you know, think of key key ways to lead to an effective marketing strategy. And it's kind of sitting, you know, with the people a part of this company and kind of picking their brain a little bit, you know, trying to say they're passionate about it. You know, it's kind of an intimate, intimate notion of what they're trying to do. And it's trying to see where they're coming from and, you know, trying to you know, create ways to, you know, develop what they've envisioned further started from the idea stage. And now they have a you know, website set up and it's making everything cohesive, everything work together from your social media to your website and, you know, funneling things like that. And just keeping everybody up to date to what you do, you know, if you're involved with awards, you know, there's a news article that came out. You want to let people know what's happening with your company. Yeah. And I think too, um, and I think Sarah and Shelley can, can comment more on this, but uh, I think on the social side, you know, it's really, and, and Shelley talked about this, is just really 
approaching it from the, a, a strategy perspective and planning it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can involve, you know, content that, you know, whether you're creating it and content creation is, is resource intensive. It takes time, it takes effort. So, you know, there's only so much of that, you know, you, that you'll be able to bank and do yourself. But then the other, the flip side of it is um, also sharing industry related content that your customers uh, would be interested in. And I think there's a thought leadership perspective of being able to share industry updates or news on your own feed. So there's a certain percentage that doesn't have to be your own content that you generate. Um, and I, you know, Sarah, Shelly, you know, I mean, I, Sarah works with, we have an intern uh, that Sarah works with very closely on social stuff. So Sarah, I don't know if there's anything you want to comment on, on there from a social perspective. Yeah, well, first I wanna say, I'm so impressed, Joseph, by your work with Inzerna. That's one of the most beautiful uh, science websites I've ever seen. So kudos to you because I love that you're just like a case study of how to do something right. And so it is that is the exact trajectory I think to take um, because and I have found this when you start with like social media first, you're just constantly playing catch up. I'm sure Aaron can agree with that. Um, so I guess what Brock just said, as far as creating content, we, we definitely have a calendar for that. I, and um, we think about, you know, the goal, which Joseph, you already have. So, and then everything that we post would align with that goal. So I'm working with Launch Chapel Hill right now as well. And our goal for this month is to uh, communicate the effectiveness of the programs in um, accelerating small businesses uh, in Orange County. And so our posts will be related to that. Um, the other thing too is taking a good look at each channel and deciding what your voice is. Um, we, this is an example of our brand guide. And in the back of it, we have each channel, you can't see it, each channel listed out and what we want it to sound like. Every channel has a different voice um, and a different perspective. We are on every channel at this point, but again, I, I don't recommend that. Um, I think having a solid plan, even for one, is a good place to start, especially if you, and when you are sharing, don't forget to tag and at mention people, which that means you put in the little at sign and then write their name um, if there's someone specific that you're writing about so they can see it too. And Joseph is exactly right. I mean, outside of angel funding, which is of course you all need, but just building up um, an awareness of what you're doing, I don't think ever hurts. And, um, you know, it's been so great. Uh, we're going to be sharing again some of these materials uh, uh, as well. I encourage everybody to look uh, at the website for, for Inserna and their social media channels. You know, if you're looking for inspiration for your own startup company, Eva here is a fantastic, again, uh, connection to have in, in the triangle. So please. Please look also you know, at the launch place. And um, we, you have all of our contact details here at, at Kickstart and Innovate Carolina. We are here to help you if you need support. So please do not hesitate in contacting us. And um, any last comments from anybody from the panel before we go? Don't be afraid to reach out and, and, and directly and, and contact your investors, future investors as soon as, as you can. I think one thing too is just um, learn to manage expectations when it comes to social media. A lot of the times you'll go into a meeting with somebody and right away, it's what are you gonna do for me? And it's more kind of let me see where you're coming from and let's see what we can do. You know, we're not gonna make your social media the biggest thing one day. It takes time, we have to grow it. And it's just the process, you know, so just manage expectations in that. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Again, uh, wonderful connections, wonderful examples, and, and we'll share the presentations. Thank you for, for participating and, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks.